Okay, we're recording. Welcome, everyone. Welcome back. It's a new year. Uh, welcome to Powerful Coach Companion with me, Sam Kopak. Um, this is the first one of the year. I'm excited to, to refresh, start again. I'm excited to bring on Izzy today. Welcome, Izzy. Ooh. Hello. <laughs> um, if you are listening to this on Spotify, you can also watch it and see our faces on YouTube. Um, but likewise, if you're on YouTube, go to Spotify and you can listen hands free. Um, so that being said, Izzy, how are you doing? Tell us a bit about yourself and what your involvement in coaching is. Oh, it's like mastermind. Hi. Um, <laughs> uh, my name's Izzy. Um, I've been doing parkour for almost a decade now. I'm based in Leicester with Jump Parkour and I've been a level one since about August 2019. 2020 has obviously made it so I can coach so much. Um, <laughs> um, but yeah, I think that's a decent overview. <laughs> hmm. So you're 19 now and you've been going yes. for a decade. Mm -hmm. So you, did you start with jump when you were nine then? Did you go to their classes first? Um, yeah, well, uh, I started when I was 10, so almost a decade, I think. So I've already messed up. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, I started when I was 10, had no idea what parkour was I just kind of showed up at the classes and they had to deal with it <laughs> so you, yeah how did, you, how did you find out about the the classes um well my mum said your brother is going to these parkour classes do you want to go and I said what the hell is parkour yeah so well, I sort of my brother and I went at the same time and then my brother dropped out a couple of years later and I just sort of kept going with it, which I don't think my parents were expecting. Mm. Mm. So, yeah, I started completely indoors for like five years and I didn't go outside for a very long time. <laughs> mm. Just in the classes then? Mm -hmm. Yeah, just indoors for like once or twice a week. Mm. And so what do you think uh, kept you going then? Like you said that your parents were... You know, that, that was unexpected. Mm -hmm. You kept going. What what do you think kept you going with it? Why did you why did you stick around? I mean, I've sort of been the more active uh, sibling <laughs> for like my whole life. But it was um, I'd recently quit gymnastics. I really didn't like the sort of the principles of that discipline. And I was sort of in limbo trying to find a sport to do. And then when I found parkour, I was like, oh, you can feel cool and look cool at the same time. So I'll just stay with that. Mm. And did, you, um, did your brother still train at all or is, he, is that a... Um, he had to drop out because of um, health reasons. But um, I think he's thinking about going back into it because he's my older brother. Mm. So trying to get him back into the scene, which will be nice. Mm. Really good. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And so you're level one qualified now. Yes. Um, how was it getting your level one? So you say you got it last year? Um, 2019. Oh, sorry. Oh, God, I, I keep thinking that's last year. So. <laughs> yeah. Um, sorry, yeah. Uh, yeah, tell us, about, tell us about your level one. Oh, my God, a nightmare. <laughs> oh. Um, it was, I don't know how much to unpack here. I could write a trilogy on this. <laughs> but um, essentially since like my first class ever I was as a 10 year old I was like I want to become a parkour coach I was just like this is the coolest thing ever so I had wanted like my plan for the whole time um because I discussed it with my the other coaches because as a kid I was like I want to do my level one like at 16 as soon as you can do it but basically a load of um mental health stuff got in the way and I had to wait another two years just to be able to do it and when by the time that I had done the level one, I didn't even know if I would be able to coach. So then as I got through the level one, Dan, my head coach, Dan Timms, he was like, see, you're fine, do it. And then managed to build up the confidence. So yeah, it was a nightmare, but it was worth it. Do you mean a nightmare in sort of getting to the point where you, you thought you could try it? Yeah, because it was... Um, I don't know how to explain it was sort of like I had been wanting this thing for like six years 
Mm. And the only thing that was holding me back from getting it was the fact that I was too anxious to do it. So I was just mm. for two years, I was like after 16, I was like, I really got to try and do it, but I just couldn't get into it. So, well, it took after that, after level one, like everything went like uphill. I was like, mm. I can do anything apart from the level two. But um. <laughs> Well, watch this space, watch this space. Um, <laughs> and so how... And so how did you actually find the the course of the level one? Did you do it in Leicester, I presume? Um, I did it in pool. So in pool? At, yeah, at the parkour project. Oh, of course, yeah. I was thinking, what's in pool? Yeah, yeah, of course. <laughs> <laughs> nice. So how, how was it? How was the experience doing it there? Way, oh, I don't know. It was actually way better and way worse than I was expecting in the sense that... Um, uh dan was there because obviously parkour uk so i just tagged along with him so it was nice to have someone there who i recognized for in terms of anxiety and stuff um mm -hmm. and the people who i met there were absolutely amazing mm -hmm. um some of them were absolute clowns but they were <laughs> they were good clowns um mm -hmm. but in terms of the actual learning process it was actually really fascinating like my i got there and realized that my first aid knowledge is absolutely terrible Hmm. <laughs> you have to relearn all these things that you thought you knew and it's actually um you know it's really good to actually coach for the first time I didn't really think I could do it but it's just everyone is on the same boat and it's just really nice to make friends over that week absolutely yeah I, I really enjoyed my level one although I did get absolutely grilled by Dan <laughs> I did mine and I did mine in like 2013 and we had quite a strong group, as in, like, quite physically strong. Yeah. So he just beasted us every day. Like, was, <laughs> <laughs> there, was no, there was no need. He just beasted us. <laughs> we just ended up doing these horrible challenges. But I think he was kind of semi-persuading it. Sorry, semi-kind of, um, uh, what's the word? Preparing us for level two. Um, because I think when we on your level, level one, he was preparing yeah. you for the level two on the level well, one. I think his thinking was that like physically, it wouldn't take a, a huge amount of training for us to finish our level one and then six months later try the level two. So I mm. think he just try <laughs> <we're> <laughs> tried to like just beast us every day. So we're doing horrible like Spider Man push ups across the floor and oh, oh god. But I mean, it was it was great. It was, and it's very, like you said, everyone's in the same boat. It's very bonding, isn't it? Mm. Um, I still, well, I, a little bit, um, probably more than I should, but I still contact the people I did my level one with, and some of them were from yes, me too. Europe, and there's a, a, a woman from Chile who'd come all the way over just to do a level one from Chile. And, yeah, and is now a coach. Why? <laughs> <laughs> Because there's nothing there. There's no, there's no. Is there not? No, I don't think. Well, God. I could be. At the time, I mean, this was this was like 2013, seven, wasn't yeah, it? Seven years ago. So, um, but no. So, um, yeah. But um, how did you? How did you kind of reconcile your like anxiety with the coaching? Then did you find the course kind of ease you into it more, or was it was it kind of throwing you at the deep end? absolutely throwing in the deep end mm, which is yeah. really well I don't know if it's too much information to say but I cried every single day mm, mm, mm. <laughs> it was yeah. um it was really hard because it was um although I'm quite an extroverted person yeah. but I'm just really I just can't speak in front of people mm. or happily just um like if if it wasn't in a coaching context, I'm so happy to just teach other adults, just like with my mates, I'll give pointers or whatever. Yeah. Um and I found that like just being put in front of other adults who I've never met before, because I'm before this I had never really gone to jams that much. Mm. So I just don't really meet people from other practices. So I was super unfamiliar with how other people trained and mm. how they were coached and stuff. So when I was put in front of all these people and I hadn't um, like, I found it difficult to get out of like the door every day. And, and then suddenly um, I asked Dan, I was like, 
because it was my go to do the mock exam coaching thing. Yes. And I was like, absolutely, like, I, I'm, am I allowed to swear? Fuck it, swear as much. I as was you. shitting my pants. Like, <laughs> I was absolutely <laughs> shitting and pissing myself. And I was like, <laughs> and I was like, is it my go? And I was like, yeah. And I, and, um, and he was like, yes. And I said, do I have to call them over? Because it's, it's in the parkour project. So like everyone is just once in the pit, one's on the sprung floor. And I, he was just like, yeah, because he knows that that is my nightmare. Right, like, yeah, yeah. I was like, or I was like moments from just leaving the room because mm. I just thought I just couldn't do it. Mm. So then I did it because um, I had the strength and training uh, conditioning one. And um, okay, nice. yeah, failed that mock, but... <laughs> Okay, but you re- did you redo it? Yeah, I, the only reason that I failed it was because I didn't have a watch and I just overran time and I didn't okay. realise. That's not so, that's, yeah. There's definitely worse ways of failing. I mean, you know, if yeah. someone broke something or <laughs> yeah. ran away, that would be, so, be worse. Yeah, I am actually wearing the watch that I bought nice. that nice. day. Just to keep it there. <laughs> Just keep it as a reminder to not forget my watch. Yeah. I actually had a funny uh, experience with a watch as well. Um, I don't know whether I – have I discussed this before? No, I haven't really. I can probably say it now. But basically, in, in my <laughs> – so when you have to get your, like, hours signed off for level one – yeah. Um, I don't know whether I think it might be different now, but when I had to get them signed off, I had to go down for the last two hours. I had to go down to London mm-hmm. and get them signed off by level three. So, i.e., um, someone higher up, like um, Chris Rowett, um, or um, what's his name? I've forgotten his name now. Uh, anyway, so I went down to London and did these did these sessions, and. I got there and met up with one of the parkour gen coaches at the train station. Mm-hmm. And we were kind of like half an hour before starting. So we were just kind of just standing around and stuff. And I remember him saying, um, where's your watch? And I said, uh, I haven't brought a watch. And he was like, oh, well, why are you here then? Are you like, are you a coach? Jesus? And it's like I traveled down from Stoke on Trent to London at like seven in the morning or something stupid. Oh my God. And he, and that was like one of the first things he said was like, where's your watch? You need to have a watch before we start this. And I just couldn't believe it. And he, and me and. Was that for the level one or level two? It was for level one. Oh my God. I know. Yeah. And I just remember thinking like, what the hell? And he said something strange, like just do whatever you have to do to get a watch. Like steal what? one go and buy one borrow one if you have to it was very i have to admit I, I i mean i do have a lot of respect for parkour gem but that sticks out as a really like bad experience that's just because... unnecessary like why yeah. would because you... i know like most coaches like most of the people on the day i know that it's difference between 2015 and 2019 but it's like phones had <laughs> had a clock yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, well just use your phone like that's just how if a coach forgets their watch like in a normal situation you just use your phone or you use yeah. someone else's watch it's just yeah exactly so, so in the end luckily i didn't have to steal a watch i um <laughs> I, I, I borrowed one off one of the other off the, one of the other like um coaches yeah but it just it was just like it was strange i don't know whether it was just kind of like a bit of a um I don't know, like a bit of an adversity thing. They wanted to kind of like throw a curveball at me, sort of thing. Mm. And the, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be surprised because they do stuff like that. <laughs> yeah. But, but at the say. same time, it just was a bit, a bit of a like sour beginning to the day. And I was like, yeah. was like what else is going to happen? Um, but in the end, it was, it was great, and I, and I actually had a really good. It was absolutely pissing it down, and <laughs> it was absolutely pissing it down. And we managed to do like a a session undercover and then like really like slow flow around these wet bars. Um, but it was, oh. it wasn't ideal at all, but it was, <laughs> we, we got there. We got there. Um, but yeah, it's a nice one for getting the other one. That's, that's a really good achievement. Um, Thanks, man. And I think it's especially good that um, there are so few uh, female coaches 
in, mm. in the UK and generally. So I think it's awesome that you've got your level one and that I hope you go on to see your level two because um, that, yeah. that is another whole experience and a, another really enriching experience as well. So Yeah, I was going to do it in um, 2020, but I went to garbage. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Because I was sort of like, oh, no, oh, whoops, I can't do it now. Oh, whoops. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I will get it one day. Yeah, yeah. And so why why do you think you had such a – I would say that's also quite unusual. Like, I don't know that many 16-year-olds who are keen to be coaches. Um, what 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 took you about coaching then? What Why do you think you wanted to, to pursue it? I mean, I just – I mean, I, for starters, it's just that I had sort of fixated, tunnel visioned on that since I was 10 years old. Um, <laughs> and I just enjoyed parkour. And I just, I've always been enjoying, that is not a sentence. I've always enjoyed yeah. um, just speaking to people and making people oh it sounds so cringy no go on why do I talk (laughs) it's like I just really enjoy entertaining people I know that sounds strange but like um as a coach I just like making people think not only not that I'm teaching them but I'm teaching them to enjoy something Mm -hmm. and then it doesn't have to be that serious and there's I don't know I feel like in parkour there is you know those there are some people who just say if you don't do xyz then you aren't taking parkour seriously it's just that xyz is not as objective as that and it's just i need to teach people that you don't have to do these things that are ideologies that people have made there are good ways to go around things but just have fun and just get over yourself (laughs) whoops (laughs) Interesting. So do you think do you think you've developed that kind of approach due to your own training or just due to how you kind of see the community? I think it sort of evolved from my own training and my own sort of relationship with training that I had through a lot of mental health in the sense that um when I was younger and when when I had like first started for the first five like four or five years I had just been because I'd been indoors and I hadn't really done anything I'd like really really refined uh, my skills indoors and then during the time I just there were some outer things but like during the cup like three or four years after that I had um my mind has just blanked. Um, yeah. I had um, sort of had this thing of if I don't perform something in parkour perfectly, then what is the point? So I wouldn't push mm. myself to do like sketchier things because it's just like if I can't do this 100%, then what's the point? And then that sort of led me to now after all that where it's just like I, I just can't keep going like that. And I mm. just I want to be bad at things if that makes sense so I just sort of I don't want any kids I'm teaching to be like <clears throat> nice voice um I don't want any kids that I'm teaching to just get into their get into their own head and say that you like this is unenjoyable because you're not doing it like you're not doing it right you're not doing it perfectly and it's just like if you're doing it then just enjoy it like you might as well yeah absolutely it's something I've been thinking more of with my own classes with with teaching kids is you you have to almost stealthily bring in parkour to parkour sessions if that makes sense like yeah yeah they have yeah to be fun they have to be um kind of escapist almost you know you can, mm. you can build kind of imaginary scenarios and that's that's what really gets them fired up and stuff and then you kind of sneak in techniques and things and some slight refinements and yeah and up to a certain age I think that is it is a more optimal approach because they that's how they they learn and and stick with it better and mm. they enjoy it and you know I, I started enjoying parkour because I was jumping off high stuff which was terrible 
Um, <laughs> but, but I mean, it was so fun that I kept doing it. And mm. it, and I'd, I wonder whether if I'd have had, had really like strict, strict parkour upbringing, you could say. Um, yeah. I wonder whether that would have put me off. So, and just having so much freedom as well. I had so much freedom. No one else was doing it when I was starting. Um, really, there's a couple of people, some good friends, but um, it was just so open that I kind of, I was like, well, I can just kind of fill the space and I can do what I want. Um, but yeah, I like that. I think, um, I think, I think you're right. And also, do you find that your coaching now do you feel more confident than when you first started coaching and um it's strange because I had sort of assumed that I would never be able to coach because of the anxiety but the moment that um I sort of started from like the first one I was absolutely fine I, I was mm. just <clears throat> I was just talking confidently which was something that I wasn't really anticipating and I think that comes a lot from just I don't know. I think it just comes from. I don't know how to explain. I think it's just that build up of I've wanted to do this for so long, and now that mm. I've done it, I might. I'm fine. Mm. So it's just like years of just stress, just relieved, and now I'm just like, okay, now I'm just gonna bully the children. <laughs> Which is what I found the best technique. I'm sorry if that's bad for a coaching podcast, but just bully the children. It's great. Well, explain. You have to explain. <laughs> you can't could, what if I just said no and didn't elaborate? <laughs> <laughs> it's hard. It's just the thing of um, it to support them. I don't to support them. I just mess around with them. I just mm. so I, when I'm teaching them a technique, if they get it really badly wrong then for me, you can't, for me personally, I don't find saying, I can't, you can't just state the obvious because they know, they know that they messed up. So I'm not just going to, I don't find that saying, it's all right, just do it, just to do it better next time. Uh, just put your feet out in front and then bend your knees more. I just go, that was really awful. <laughs> and they're just like, yeah, I know. <laughs> and it's just, you've got to just, like the next time they go up to the line, you've got to go, you better redeem yourself because that was absolutely garbage. And they're just like, <laughs> just shut up and just let me do this thing. It's just relieving tension. It's just, I don't want any <laughs> tension to build up. And for that, I bully children. <laughs> that is actually super interesting. Yeah. Because obviously when you're in a position, there's things that you're thinking that you can't say. Um, yeah. <laughs> and you have a... Sort of... <laughs> I mean, I say them anyway, but well... sure. <laughs> But yeah, as in like, that's interesting that it helps you to kind of express things just a bit more authentically than, than being yeah. there. But I definitely have like a, a sort of coaching hat on when I coach um, and mm. kind of just up the sort of energy and enthusiasm levels a certain amount. Yeah, yeah. Um, but maybe I should just try some some brutal negativity <laughs> yeah to make sure it's verbal don't just stop beating them. yeah 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 no, no, no. <laughs> um yeah um so do you think that do you do you use humor in your coaching then yeah i don't sorry I do don't you think... actively use humor in your coaching i i don't know i sort of the difference between um me in person and my coaching persona are quite similar because i know people have one and the other are very different especially if the more serious coaches yeah, yeah um but i just sort of automatically use humor because i find that if i were super serious i would get bored incredibly quickly and that would sort of rub off on them it would if i'm not interested in what i'm doing then why would i coach it if you know what i mean so i sort of make sure that um when I'm doing something, my heart's in it. And if it's boring, then I'll let them know it's boring. Like if we're drilling something like pre's, which is really important, but it might not be good if it's super repetitive. I'm just like, I want you to bounce it. And if you do badly, then just leave the class and I'll take your name off the register. <laughs> Obviously I'm not going to do that, but like, I just, I walk around and I just mess with them and I try and distract them safely. Yeah 
just yeah. in case Dan is watching. <laughs> I mean, he I, he's always watching my coaching, but whatever. Yeah, it's just if it's just you need to. I I personally find that I need to relieve tension by just not building any tension. Mm. But so yeah, just humor is just the easiest way to do that. Interesting. And do you have um, many girls in your classes? Do you teach many girls? I mean, I'm pretty sure I was I was the only girl who trained there consistently for like nine years. So I didn't really have anyone with me. But um, I think the, the number of girls in the adults class has increased within like the last couple of months. And it's been really jarring to me for some reason. It's just I've never seen like girls in the classes and I don't really go to jams that often. So I just it was really weird being like there are women <laughs> it's like even though I'm like what but um yeah it's and I found that um the girls there have really come out of their out of their show in terms of the um uh the the kids the the kid girls what's the, just the girls <laughs> I'm trying to think of the word I'm just losing my mind but <laughs> the small women's but they're like they're, it's just oh, I found man. that I like to I use humor especially on them because they're generally super quiet because they are completely outnumbered so I just I just like to walk around and just talk to them and mm. not talk to them as in like hi buddy but just literally go up to them and bully them specifically because then they start laughing and then because laughing in front of someone is like a massive indicator that you're comfortable around people. So I just, yeah, when when the girls started uh, coming to the classes, I just like to be in the background, even if I'm not coaching that day, I just like to be walking around to make sure that they're not alone and they're not feeling uncomfortable. Nice, nice. And do you... Bullying them? Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> well, one of my questions was, do you, do you treat, you know, how do you manage um, mixed gender classes? But it seems, sounds like you just bully everyone, so it's pretty pretty equal. Yeah, I just <laughs> the way to stop discriminating is to discriminate against everyone. <laughs> that is the man. Don't don't <laughs> don't do that. <laughs> but um, yeah, I don't. Some people ask me is um, how do you adapt your coaching to um, make girls feel welcome? Mm. And the thing about that is. If you have to adapt your coaching to make girls feel welcome, you're not coaching correctly. Like how, if you're if you're having to change to make some a whole group of people feel welcome, what are you doing wrong in the first place? And it's like you really need to look at what you're doing to make things uncomfortable. And people might think, oh, well, I'm not doing anything, but evidently something is happening that makes people feel uncomfortable. And maybe it's just. You have to be, as a coach, super explicit that you support people, and that you have to be like painfully cringe, cringely. <laughs> that's not a word. Explicit yeah. with things. Yeah. Mm. And that can be really valuable because some people don't know if they're supported, and just going up to them and saying you are supported that does wonders. Mm -hmm. mm. That was nice. That was very nice. Um, Thank you. <laughs> to follow up the bullying monologue. Yeah, you kind of countered it a little bit there. Um, <laughs> what was I going to say? Uh, yeah. So how how is your coaching, or sorry, has your coaching experience affected your your training experience? Is there? Do you find that there's been kind of overlap in the way that your mind works with parkour in a class and parkour, you know, outside? Mm. I think I don't know I've thought about I saw this on the list and I'm really not sure mm. because by the time that I had become a coach I had already been training with the other coaches outside quite a lot so I'd already been exposed to a lot of um, sort of coaching techniques and so I've I'd talked to them loads before anything happened because they're just my mates now. Mm. So I found that um, after my level one, after I'd gotten all that um, 
got, gotten through the level one experience, I just found that I was just much more inclined to pay attention to how my friends train and what their attitudes towards the challenges. And I think that when, after coaching, not necessarily my technique changed, but my attitude changed in the sense that when my friend was getting frustrated um, and they were thinking, oh, I should be able to do this because I'm, I've been training for ages and also they're, they're a coach and also they're trying to list off these things like why am I not able to do this I've done a jump bigger than this I've done I'm just like bro chill like with coaches we shouldn't it's we don't the title of coach doesn't suddenly mean that you have to live up to an expectation apart from when you're coaching in the sense that like if you're trying to improve yourself then don't get angry at yourself because there's I think parkour is a sport I felt the most that um we're so hard on ourselves especially (laughs) like just any context it's like you're just it it can be something that literally doesn't matter and coaches will just be punching drywall about it and I'm just you've got to be careful because you've got to catch yourself out on it because otherwise the students are going to be getting really angry at themselves in class and you're just like oh why are you angry and it's like because they've watched you get angry (laughs) at something it's just you've got to um really I thankfully none of my coaches like that by the way just Dan don't kill me please um it's it's just yeah so coaching has just taught me that it's sort of opened an eye to training in the sense that I just don't take things seriously Mm. because you're coaching it's like you're never gonna have like you're never gonna have a perfect training session every time you're never gonna have a perfect coaching session every time so it's just relieving that pressure again. Absolutely. I, I, I've been thinking about this quite a lot more over the last year, seeing myself get frustrated and seeing other people get frustrated and, and thinking, like, what makes a good session? Because I feel like you're right. People are very hard on themselves. And it's not a good, for them, it's not a good session unless they've done something that they're happy with yeah it's it's got to be something huge as well like every time it's like yeah. it's not possible yeah it's not sustainable really as well and yeah sustainable I, just, I mean and I, I just yeah um I, I do sometimes watch people train and I, I'm thinking to myself like are you enjoying this are you actually enjoying this mm. um I so I, yesterday I went to Nova City and it was the first time I trained in like trained like kind of properly for a couple of months actually I've kind of been doing a lot of gym work and it's been very damp around here Mm. so I've not been out that much but I just really was just super playful all day and it was amazing yeah I was at the Rotherham gym yes oh my god I forgot that was on I was gonna go Oh, you can go today. I mean, it's a bit late now, but oh god, no, still I go. can't go there. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, it's so I was just, I don't know. Sometimes I feel in big, well, in big places like that, where there's you know people there, I do feel a bit more self-conscious, and there's kind of oh, for sure, like a sort of tacit expectation kind of level from people and stuff. But I, yeah. I just had fun, and it was great. It was so fun. I was just messing about and trying like rather is so easy to mess about in as well it's just such a fun setup as well it's a great setup yeah um and i yeah i just loved it i'm just i walked away from the session just feeling happy and and good and Mm. trying to yeah just find that balance between playfulness and like moments of intensity um oh yeah yeah so it was great. Um, but yeah, you, I've seen, you've got a few clips there, actually. Have you been, have you travelled there with Dan and stuff? Like, has that been? Yeah, I went a couple of times in December. Did I go in over? I have terrible memory. But yeah, I was really, I don't know, because obviously um, Leicester doesn't really have an indoor gym. So we can't, we've been at spots in the wet and damp. And yeah. then suddenly going to places like 
not even necessarily indoors, but just going to Rotherham and things. It was just so fun. And I just, I found that like in the last couple of, um, I mean, in the last year, last couple of months, especially that I'm finally at a place in parkour where it's like, I am pushing myself, but I don't have to like uh, give up fun. And I'm just Mm. pushing myself is fun. Mm. So it's like when I'm going for a huge challenge, like I'm I'm really casual about it because I just it used to be a thing of I'm going for this huge challenge and it has to cause me anxiety and it has to be like oh if if I do this it's going to be a huge moment and it's like if I do that I found myself like like a year ago I was spending way too much time online and I was just like every time I would try and go for a challenge that was just remotely impressive for me I would be like I could feel like a camera just like off mm. the side, even though there wasn't one. And I just, there was that, there was that pressure that just didn't exist. And it's just, um, I found that it's just, that's one of the things about people not enjoying it as much anymore. It's because there's this, even if it's positive, you have a positive relationship with social media or whatever, it can be really distracting to your entire attitude that if you're pushing yourself are you pushing it because it looks cool or are you pushing it because it feels cool or whatever or something really deep like that you know mm-hmm. <laughs> well it's interesting that some people i'm going to mention him again just because he's great uh flynn disney is talking oh yeah talking a bit more about yeah the the feeling the feeling of movement and it's something mm. that you know, we see clips, we see movements that are impressive, but people don't, as, apart from saying this one, this one felt great. People don't yeah. really talk about like actually how it feels to move in different ways. And the feeling tends to be more in line with the, the, the reaction, you know, mm-hmm. um, and seeing the, the jubilation of like completing a challenge or something that tends to be like a bit more focused on like the hype kind of surrounding it. But I just find it, yeah, really cool that he's looking more into how movements feel and how we can be aware of how they feel. Um, and that that is yeah. like, that's, that's something that's hard to express on camera because it's your own personal For sure. thing, but it's so like, it's so huge. It's, like, yeah. It's so huge. fundamental. It's yeah. crazy. Yeah. It's, um, I had a thought, but then I immediately lost it, which is so good. Um, All right, I'll come back. <clears throat> sorry, I'm just going into my mind palace. Um, I'll just talk about, have you got, um, is that like a, what map is that behind you? Um, Skyrim. Oh, nice. And is that a, animal, you've got a lot of gaming stuff there, that's cool. That's an Animal Crossing, like and animal that's crossing. Westeros. Westeros, what's that from? Uh, Game of Thrones. Haven't finished shooting it, but, nice. and those are albums album covers yeah i can't recognize any of them (laughs) there's like three system of the down ones nice 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 (laughs) (laughs) um so outside of outside of your classes yeah and obviously it's a bit different you being an assistant coach Mm -hmm. um do you how much do you like think about coaching or plan for your sessions Oh my god! I wish I had my level one plan with me, because yeah. I most of the other coaches they just sort of show up on the day and they're like, "Oh, what are you going to do? What are they going to do?" And they're like, "Oh, I'll do kongs then," and then they just set up <laughs> some kongs. And I'm just like, I think I would have a heart attack if I did that. But that's that being said, I'm not um, I'm not someone to plan like I, I'm not someone to have a timetable. I'd rather die than have a timetable. I don't like like writing things down but um I have to I have to message um the head coach Dan and just be like and can I do this is it okay if I do this can I use this amount of blocks can I do and I'm just like and he's just like just you're fine like Mm. (laughs) if I showed you my level one plan um I don't know if I actually have some but um sometimes I literally just draw out a diagram of the entire setup and all of the plot I might have I might just think of it but um find it I mean but there's a 
yeah, I like to plan a lot just mm. for the sake of anxiety. And I think that's, that's literally the only reason, not because of, I feel like it's helpful, but just to sort of put my mind at ease before I do anything. Mm. I can definitely relate. I am definitely more on the planning side. It's funny. You should listen to, this is plug, but I yeah, I want, uh, <laughs> Uh, the last podcast I had with Andy from Germany, he is yeah. like the opposite. He, and he talks about it quite a lot. I would, I would recommend listening to it because he's so mm. laid back and he just talks about this kind of, I don't know, experienced adaptability that he's just nurtured over the oh, years. for sure. And it's just, it's so interesting because I, I'm, yeah, like I've been teaching for a while now, but I, I still definitely need to, write out things have some idea of the structure yeah some idea of where the blocks are gonna go and and this and that and it really helps me um yeah I, th I think I don't know because I'm I'm someone who's quite spontaneous and goes on my intuition but it's I'm super happy with like my experience and that I can fall back on that just generally I could show up and just do it spontaneously but I think it's just I'd hate I think it's just because when I'm speaking, I hate to stumble or stutter. Yeah. So my planning is not because I don't feel prepared. It's because I'm not, I don't feel prepared to stutter. Mm. And because that's just a thing where it's like, that could really onset my anxiety. Mm. So it's like, I don't, I don't plan because I don't know what I'm doing. I plan because I know what I'm doing and I want to express it properly. If that makes sense. Absolutely. Yeah. I yeah. find this bloody thing <laughs> I swear it's helpful it's really um, not <laughs> um, whilst you're doing that how, who who inspires you in your own well we'll say we'll, we'll start with coaching and then with just general training yeah um, <clears throat> I mean my first um, I think my two main inspirations from when I was like 10 and still now is um, Dan and Tim who were the two the co-founders of Jump Parkour I think I just I had never met two cooler people in my life I was like mm. I can't believe these people exist mm. <laughs> but it was um, I looked up to both of them because they were completely different coaches because you, you know Dan right I know complete both, extrovert yeah. yeah yeah Dan complete extrovert and just acts like he thinks he's Captain America but I've told <laughs> him I've told him that he's more like Loki disguised as Captain America <laughs> which I thought was more accurate which he agreed to but um and Tim is the massive introvert so they're just like black and white yin and yang wow. and I was super um interested in coaching because I was like oh you can be a coach you to be a coach you don't have to be super extroverted you don't have to um confine yourself to some sort of trope because <clears throat> like <clears throat> although Tim was um Tim's a uh, like introverted he's very confident and very funny and it's like that's really cool and then they were just it was like when you move stations and you go go between coaches, it's like a different teaching style. And I think that's one of the things I credit a lot of my experience to in parkour and that sort of flexibility is that I, although I was taught, they may have taught me the same things like you know, on different stations, like they teach um, crabs on this station and crabs on that station, like two different coaches, I, they were built in different ways. So I didn't learn the same thing twice and they sort of, they enjoyed parkour in different ways and they enjoyed coaching in different ways. Mm. Yeah. I, I I've had some experience with jump over the years and it, that, that, that did fascinate me as well. Um, the, mm. the difference between those two guys, really, really cool. Um, and so in your own training then, who, who inspires you? Uh, um, I don't the thing is I don't watch too many people online mm. I just I don't know I just I'm 
I think it's because I just don't like using social media a lot. I just use it too much. So mm. I just sort of don't like to watch a lot of people. Um, trying to think. I think the video that I always go back to and that I just cannot stop watching ever, and I don't think anyone can ever stop watching it, is um, Oleg Out of Time. How did I know you were going to say that? That was really weird. I knew you were going to say that. <laughs> Yeah, because it's just, that video is just like, every time you get in a rut about parkour, it's just like, oh, it's fun. Mm. like And it feels fun. And it's just, that video is just great. I don't know how to explain. I can't believe that you thought I was going to say that. That's so annoying. It's, it's strange. such a normie. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, I think in the, in the scheme of things, very few people know um, out of time. Yeah, I would say, uh, no, I'd say I'd say you're in a very niche community. <laughs> what niche? Um, but but yeah, incredible, incredible video. Mm. Um, out of yeah, out of time was way ahead of its time. I think. Um, yeah, yeah. It's, yeah. It's crazy how it just still holds up. I think that's one of the reasons I go back yeah. to it as well. I think that one of the reasons is just because it was fun. Yeah. It does. It definitely showcases that playfulness way more than you see nowadays. I would say. Yeah. He's kind of dance. He's like he, he's incorporating dance and break dance and strange mm. like, like I don't know, like bailing and like jumping into trees and stuff. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, it's interesting. My 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 assistant coach Hector, shout out to him, is very mm. is very playful and in a very helpful way he has become really good at bailing and yeah yeah i guess people call it ukemi like um oh yeah I, I didn't i hadn't heard that term until um level one sorry continue yeah um so uh, understanding how to fall safely understanding how to react to slips falls and things like that and he's really good at it yeah and i think part of that is come from a sense of playfulness and a sense of um he's not very rigid as a as a practitioner i think yeah there is quite a lot of quite rigid people in parkour and i understand why mm. because a lot of the movement's quite linear but at the same time he's just like you know moving around the floor and and doing yeah. all sorts of things and it's actually it's really cool because he, he just he he, he's then he then feels a lot more safe with what he's doing because he's got so much so many backup options yeah that's a I really like it when people that's the thing with um great right, I I'm glad I finished the sentence there um I just like it <laughs> I just like it when people have a lot of um backup options and because mm. when when people sort of constrain themselves to very linear things you can see the rigidity and it's not necessarily just their form that seems rigid i'm acting like i'm some expert but um no, carry on. That's fine. it's i it's sort of knowing that although linear roots are super impressive and these big powerful movements are always going to be really cool it's i really like that people do these sm not smaller movements but they aren't afraid to do big movements that aren't I don't know if orthodox is the word but um, not afraid to try like big movements or try and make things that just aren't necessarily going to work but just feel cool and it's like, I don't, I don't have really have any complaints about people who do big movements because I'll always like, I'll always like some massive tic tac or something. But it's yeah, just like it. I think I found the um oh, cool. thing. I am going to scream if I don't find this immediately. <laughs> um, there's one. I don't know if you can see at the top. I have like. Oh, nice. Some plans of the blocks. Yeah. I have a larger page of them, but um, I just I even color code them not because I think it looks pretty, but because I forget what the blocks look like. Mm. 
Um, don't think I have the other one at hand. Oh, yeah, there we do. There we go. I have this massive one. Awesome. So for people listening, uh, Izzy's just showing like some diagrams that have been very heavily articulated. Is that the word? Yeah, annotated, maybe. Annotated, that's the word. Hopefully um, I didn't have any bank uh, details up on my <laughs> thing when I showed that, because this is a journal. Yeah, I, I don't think I don't think you will. I think, you, I think you're safe. Not. <laughs> I don't think my audience, which have about 50 subscribers, I don't think there's many frauds in there. <laughs> um, let's, let's hope. But um, <clears throat> see, I had in my list to ask you about the... I guess you could say political shifts in purple mm. over the last couple of years. Do you want to dip into this or is it going to, is it going to, is it worth it? Um, I honestly don't mind because I think it's, I, 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 you know, even though these events kind of happen and then everyone talks about it and then they kind of, they still kind of like recede and then yeah. we're not talking about it anymore. Like, I don't know. So I was, I, was you. I mean, do you want to talk about any of any of the things that have happened over the last couple of years? Well, I think the thing is that people have started thinking that parkour is getting more political, or that, or well, that implying that parkour at some point was apolitical. But I think the thing that has been happening recently is obviously as the parkour community is expanding at a rate that we've never seen before. It used to be that if you do parkour, you basically know everyone or know of everyone or your mate knows them. Um, we don't have that um, hyper connection anymore. And that when people, that not only does that produce content that we don't want, like everyone when you used to produce parkour content people used to know about it but now people are producing parkour content that just doesn't fit in with morals or something i mean calling for uh for example pasha's video calling that parkour content is um not really the word for it anymore <laughs> but thankfully he was with that situation he was on the way out of the parkour community and into the sort of viral community and um, <clears throat> that sparked a lot of annoyances, um, for the most part, just being downright fucking cringy. Um, but essentially, the thing that annoyed me about that was not the video or the caption or Pasha himself, but the comments that like renowned parkour athletes were saying who I like, I don't know the names of loads of athletes, but it was just the big ones who were saying, who were making videos and making posts about how this isn't misogynistic and all of them were men. And I know that like opinions matter, but it's just, I, to put it in my perspective, I've been doing parkour since I was 10 and it's just I know what I've been doing for a decade. And throughout that, before even stepping into the parkour community online, because I just didn't really know that there was an online parkour community, I had been experiencing sexism from, like, as long as I can remember. <clears throat> so it's like I don't really say much about it. I don't know why my voice is breaking. But um, it's, like, for example... Like when I said that it was super tiring when when I saw that video I posted that it was really tiring to see that people some people were just like it's not that big of a deal but it's like it's tiring not that one video is tiring but the fact that offline since I was 10 I've been experiencing stuff like this because like you know when you're like a you someone you know is in a car and they beep and they walk go past you and you're like walking down the street and they beep at you. It's really jarring as like a 10 year old to learn that people aren't doing that because they know you anymore. You start looking in the cars that are beeping at you and they're strangers. And it's like, you realize from then on that, Oh, your mom has to explain it. Like when you're 10, that they're just, they're being sexual. And it's like, you're 10. It's like, what am I doing wrong? Mm -hmm. So it's like when, 
so like as I was growing up, this is a really long-winded example, but um, I started parkour at the same time as my mate Ryan, basically. And we both grew up together and we were doing exactly the same classes, exactly the same exercises, exactly the same everything, basically. But as we were growing older, people were sort of underestimating us because we were kids. But then he sort of dropped off parkour a little bit and I kept going. But people, when we did train together, people weren't underestimating him. But they were underestimating me, even though that thing was there. And I was like, I just don't really understand. Like, do I look different? But then it took me a while to realize that he's, people are always going to take him a bit more seriously than me. So then when Pasha posted this thing, I was just, it was just like, I'm just going about my day and just another thing pops up. And it's just like, and people are like, oh, it's not that bad. You're just being left wing. It's like, I'm not being like some massive leftist. It's just, I've dealt with this for so long. And it's like, it doesn't infuriate me. It just infuriates me that people are just like, saying that parkour is becoming left wing it's like it's not parkour is trying to become inclusive and people are trying to prevent that for some reason but yeah that's my monologue <laughs> that's a really important monologue i think um i <clears throat> i totally agree with what you're saying that parkour is growing and more and more people are coming into the sport from different backgrounds and and uh, from different experiences, and you have to appreciate that. Mm. You can't, I mean, yeah, sure. You know, the the days of like twenty ten to twenty thirteen, like people kind of people do look at them with nostalgia now because it was like the golden time of parkour. Things were changing very rapidly. Yeah. Progress was huge, but like, what weren't we seeing then? We weren't seeing things that like you're describing. And that's because yeah. we were an insular, like, male community. Yeah. So, yeah, it's all right that we had our fun. And that that is great. And, you know, that was helpful to us. But, yeah, I agree. I just think that if you, if you, if you are supportive of the parkour community, that includes everyone that's in it. And you have, to, you have to hear what their opinions are, especially when something's not quite right. Um, mm. So... So yeah, I, I I totally agree, and um, but I, but I'm positive though. I think I think it's really good that like people like Rachel and yourself and other athletes are are voicing these concerns um, yeah. because it takes a bit of guts to do that, especially when you're in the minority. And I think um, I mean I saw Rachel yesterday. I didn't have much chance to talk to her, but you know. Again, she's like the only girl there. Well, there's maybe a couple of girls there. Um, mm. And I think she's done really well to, to, to highlight some issues and change. Well, just, just you know, give, <laughs> give the male community a, 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 a prod, really, that, that yeah. they definitely has needed um, for a while. So I, I'm pretty positive about how things are going to progress and I think that unfortunately there will be more probably controversial stuff that happens for um, sure yeah I think that is kind of the nature of vi virality like viral videos there has mm. to be people do make it big because they do you know kind of controversial stuff that is one way to 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 uh to fame you know yeah of um, course but at the same time, yeah, I think that it's, it's, I feel quite good about people having these conversations and actually just listening <laughs> to women. Yeah, I think it's especially with um, Hazal speaking up more explicitly about it. Mm. Um, that was quite big. And I think this, for my, in my personal opinion, the most important statement um, came from people like Callum Powell because although it's like he's he's a guy and he can't speak on behalf of girls um it's just he's very respected not just by the younger generation of people coming in but by people who are like the older guys 
who just don't really want to change their opinion. And uh, when he spoke to it, I know it's like, it's, I'm not trying to be cynical in saying this, but in order for, um, for guys to listen to women, it has to come from a guy. And I, I know that's, it's not, a, I'm not trying to be cynical or anything. It's just, if, for example, if a guy said something about being a man, I'd be like, oh, okay. But then if my female friend was like elaborating on it and saying and emphasizing what we can do, then it's just a naturally easier. So him, so that, that's why it's so important for guys to speak up about it. And they don't think when they're like, oh, I don't think I can add anything to this. It's like what you can add is just making sure that your mates don't do anything stupid. And it's um it's not like a it's not trying to restrict people or to make people have a super strict set of morals or to live up to this ridiculous expectation of not being completely uncancelable. It's just realizing that you've got to realize that there are just things that you can't really say if you want to be inclusive and it, I, it really hurt that seeing especially co people who are coaches like sp doing videos saying like oh you're s such a snowflake if you think this is stupid or like people in the comments saying I saw like some people who were coaches or just at least athletes in the comments section just being just straight up sexist or that they were for example just being um transphobic to uh trans athletes and it's like if one of your students came up to you and said um please don't can you please not call me by this name because i'm transgender what are you gonna do are you gonna like what if your students saw your comments like the coach that they looked up to and I know it's sort of that divide between coaching and what you post online because that's your private account. But it's like you're the same person and mm -hmm. you've got to just if that's one of the things with like people who will want to be called they them instead of like she, her, he, him. It's like no matter what your opinion is on it, if a kid comes up to you and says, can you call me they them? Like, well, would you say no to the kid? And it's like, if you say no, then why? And it's like, why would you try and alienate that? And it's just a thing of, we've got to get past this point of making people feel alienated just because we have these values that have been held up because other, like the other guys in the parkour community just, they have the same opinion. So why would I change it? Mm, absolutely. Yeah. Um, yeah 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 <laughs> <laughs> um <clears throat> i think there's some really valid stuff in there i think that um yeah um i think maybe we talked about because i i was talking to well not to you specifically but in the sort of move mag um discord thing oh yeah um i think one thing i mentioned um kind of brokenly was yeah that men do need to call out other men on these issues because it might be the most efficient way of them unfortunately it might be the most efficient way of them being sorted or yeah I think there's no shame in that though I think that's just natural mm, mm. um and also I think what I, I was saying in the in the discord thing is like there's such a huge barrier for men to to be in any way um, to display classically feminine traits. Yeah. Um, and I've started experimenting with this and I just, I think it's so, so helpful, so healthy. Like being, yeah. being not just one aspect of a societal norm, if that makes sense. Like, mm. um, being you know softer in certain situations and 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 being a bit more um you know or flam see i don't want to i don't want to say I, it's it's almost hard to use these words because i also don't there's no shame in them that's the thing it's like i know what you're on about so you don't that's another thing that's um 
because even just mentioning these things, you're just like, I don't want to sound feminine when I say that. You can just say it. Like, it is, no, it's I, another I, thing of, uh, yeah, whatever. It, it's, not, it's not actually that I don't want to sound feminine. It's, it's that I, um, I, I'm trying to talk about uh, disrupting norms by using yeah. norms, if you see what I mean. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so as in, I'm, I'm saying like, classically feminine traits in in quotations because that in itself needs to be a little bit like dissected because mm, yeah yeah essentially human experience encompasses extremes of different ends doesn't it you know you can be very forthright you can be very gentle and there's there's lots of things yeah that it doesn't have to be necessarily a gender thing um but yeah mm. basically my point is men should be a bit should feel like they can can they don't have to uphold this super masculine um oh for sure thing and it's because it helps it helps boys it helps girls it helps everyone <laughs> yeah it helps, it helps girls, everyone it helps feel good like you know um so that's my that's, that's my broken kind of uh kind of ramble <clears throat> <laughs> um but yeah i think we are kind of nearly at the end now um, i'll ask you one last question um mm -hmm. which is what are your aspirations as a coach and as a practitioner uh, ooh, i feel like this is such a different thing for every single coach, obviously, well, obviously, because then you wouldn't have asked the question. But um, I think short term is that I just want to get my level two because um, I've been pestered to be doing that since uh, since I got my level one, basically. And um, I think that's mainly my coaching goal because I'm quite happy with the direction it's going in. But uh, in terms of practitioner... I think I just really want to loosen up and just get rid of this idea that I still sometimes hold that I need to be doing great things, whatever great is. And that I, I don't know. I just, I don't know. I'm quite happy with just going with the flow and seeing what happens. Oh, that was oh, going with the flow. Oh, what a bad. <laughs> that wasn't meant to be a pun, but oh, <laughs> gross. Be, okay, be, sounds like <laughs> being more at ease. Yeah, just being more at ease, and that doesn't necessarily mean doing flowy mo movements on disabled ramps. But, um, <laughs> whoops. Uh, but um, just I think. Be being looser for me isn't doing um like stuff like uh Oleg out of time that kind of movement first of all because I'm really shit at lashes but second of all I just um like being looser can mean just doing linear things but with less of an expectation and more of an intention because as long as my intentions are 100% I don't really care what comes out so Nice. That's it. That sounds very familiar to what Dan Edwards was saying on, on my podcast about. Oh. No, no, in a good way. <laughs> Linking ideas. <laughs> um, thank you. Yeah. So we, we'll wrap up there. Thank you very much, Izzy. That was a really fun podcast. And, thank you for letting me on. Yeah. Uh, I think I did. I think we have met like maybe once. Uh, I saw you in a class, I think, like a long time ago. But it'd be good to train and it'd be good to come down and see the jump guys again. Um, yeah, sweet. Let, let me know if you're in, in Rotherham again because it'd be good to train at Nova. Oh, I'll probably go back soon. It's winter. So. Yeah. yeah exactly. Hell yeah. Um, yeah, you can find links for Izzy above on Spotify and below on YouTube. Um, so go and check out his stuff. Um and yeah, if you are still listening on Spotify, you can roll over to the next episode, which was with Andy Vogelsberg from uh, Germany, who was super interesting to talk to. And 
definitely on the more laid back side of things which is super interesting to hear so um check that out as well um but thank you again izzy and have a good day and sweet you too i will look forward to um attempting to bully more children in a hell yeah in a, ruthless in a, do it in a constructive way <sighs> that's not the fun right <laughs> sure whatever <laughs> cool all right see you next time thank you everyone